Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if, Ranjiku falls in love with Naruto, part 1, subscribe if you enjoy the video, let's start the story. Well, I'd say that it's about time we finish this little battle, and all of the battles we've had since we became a team. Shouted Sasuke. But this wasn't Sasuke that was loved by the civilians of Kanahagakur or by nearly all of the girls of his age group. No, that Sasuke was long gone, and was replaced by something that one would say only existed in nightmares. Bon was the mysterious, secluded boy that several of the young Kinoichi frowned over. In his place was a grey-skinned monstrosity with ash-coloured hair and wings shaped like giant hands with small fingers jutting out all over them. The sclera of his eyes were jet black, with the shuringan still visible, as the cornea. In the middle of his nose was a black shuriken-shaped mark, and his lips looked as if they were wearing black lipstick, with enlarged teeth that looked like fangs jutting out. If the Achiha's appearance wasn't unsettling enough, then his opponent was more capable of frightening any regular passerby. Standing several feet across from the winged Avenger was a boy wearing an orange jumpsuit that was torn and scratched in several places. The most noticeable damaged area was the hole that was in front of and behind his right shoulder, giving it the appearance that someone's fist had punched through him. The boy's face had a pair of three jagged whisker-like marks that looked as if they were carved into each of his cheeks. His eyes were dark red, with thin slits for pupils, giving them the appearance of a demon. But the finishing piece to his terrifying look was the large mass of boiling red chakra in the shape of a fox that was surrounding his entire body. Their battleground was at the rocky base of a large waterfall, with two enormous statues of Kanoha's founding fathers facing each other on opposite sides. To the right of the waterfall was the Shadaim Haokage, Hashirama Senju. Facing directly in front of the Senju monument was the first original leader of the Achiha clan, Madara Achiha. This specific area was named the Valley of the End, due to the notorious battle between the two founding fathers, which forever altered the landscape. In remembrance, the people of Kanoha carved enormous statues of the combatants on the opposite sides of the large waterfall, symbolizing the undying conflict that lasted between them. But the most ironic part of the current area was that another battle of similar epic proportions was taking place. On Madara's side stood Sasuke Achiha, the top rookie of his graduating Ninja Academy class, who was attempting to defect from Kanoha in order to train under Rachimaru, the traitorous snake Sanin. On Hashirama's side was Naruto Uzumaki, the of the Kaiubi no Kitsune, and the dead last amongst his peers. His reason for being here? He was part of the team charged with the task of subduing Sasuke and bringing him back to Kanoha. Unfortunately, the escort that was responsible for bringing Sasuke to Itakagur were Orochimaru's personal guard, five dangerous Odonin that were highly proficient at using the traitorous Anin's curse mark. The retrieval team was forced to combat these ninja with each member fighting one Odonin by themselves. This resulted in Naruto ending up as the only one left to pursue the rogue Sasuke. Naruto had chased after the renegade until he finally caught up to him at the monument, hoping that he could try to reason with his wayward teammate. To the young blonde's dismay, however, Sasuke was dead set on defecting from Kanoha and was willing to kill anyone that stood in his way. That part had really hurt Naruto, as he somewhat saw Sasuke as an annoying prick of a friend. After Sasuke had tried to kill him twice, he was forced to use the Kyuubi's chakra and take action against the Achiha. This gave the young Uzumaki a much-needed edge against Sasuke, who couldn't land a single strike against the kayubi powered genin. Not one to be outdone by anyone, Sasuke activated the second state of his heaven curse mark, which evened the playing field for the Achiha. Now, after a long and fierce battle, both combatants were on their last legs and had enough strength for one final attack. But the last attack meant something different to each combatant. For Naruto, it was his last chance to bring Sasuke back and fulfill his promise to Sakura. For Sasuke, it was his one chance to finally break free from the very village that had been holding him back and finally obtain vengeance against Itachi. This will end it. Thought the two ninjas as they prepared their final attacks. Sasuke thrust his left palm towards the ground and began to channel lightning chakra, producing condensed bluish-white sparks. But then, Sasuke began to channel the curse mark's chakra into the attack, causing the sparks to change to a menacing black color, and the chirping sound that usually accompanied the was replaced with a sound similar to flapping wings. Meanwhile, Naruto was trying his best to form a Rasengan, but was having some difficulty. His left arm had become numb from the extended use of the Kyuubi's chakra, and he needed two hands to perform it correctly. Despite this, Naruto concentrated on forming a Rasengan in his right hand. Surprisingly, he felt the chakra starting to condense, not knowing that the demon fox's influence was responsible for this, as well as the chakra orb size and color. The chakra condensed even further into a spiraling purple sphere that was surrounded by a layer of red demonic chakra. Without wasting any more time, the two combatants launched themselves towards one another, determined to finish the fight in one final strike, the distance was closed in seconds. Tidori, Basengan, 
The two collided with a massive clash, both of them fighting to overcome the other. The two different types of chakra caused a massive reaction, which expanded until the two shinobi were engulfed by it and made the down pouring water from the waterfall split. Not a second later, the sphere emitted a blinding light unlike any that has been witnessed before. One, of Kakashi. Kakashi was at a loss for words at the sight that he saw afar. He had hoped that he could get to his students in time, before either of them killed one another. But, it was obvious that he was too late. As he continued towards his students, he thought back to when his genin team had just started out. He thought about everything that they had gone through, trying to figure out where things went wrong. Sure, he could have done a few things differently, and he could have tried to spend equal amounts of time with each of his students, but things just got too complicated. After everything that happened from the team's first high-ranked mission to the exams, Sasuke's situation needed the most attention. After all, how else would he have been able to survive against Gar? I just hope that I can get there in time to at least keep the damage to a minimum. Thought Kakashi, as he and Pakin doubled their pace. One, within the sphere, both Naruto and Sasuke fought with all their might to come out on top. The two of them were reaching their limits, the strength in their attacks being drastically reduced to their own natural chakra, and they both knew that they needed to end the battle quickly. At the same time, the boys forced their attacks towards different directions, Naruto's Rasengan went upwards, while Sasuke's Shidori traveled downwards. The lightning style plunged through Naruto's chest, stabbing through the center and out the other side. Naruto felt the traitors rip into his body, as well as the blood rushing towards his mouth, but somehow managed to keep the Rasengan albeit being drastically weakened. Desperation finally taking full effect for the blonde, Naruto thrust his hand towards the head, connecting with the area around Sasuke's left eye. Despite the excruciating pain they were both in, the two genin struggled with all their might until the searing light was too much, causing them to break their concentration. Then, everything went black. One, after what seemed like an eternity, Naruto finally regained consciousness. Getting to his feet, he immediately saw the crumpled form of Sasuke Uchiha, not too far away from where he was. The young turncoat was desperately trying to get to his feet and seemed to be clutching the area where his left eye was. After several attempts, Sasuke managed to somehow stand up but was having trouble just staying upright. As he slowly staggered to where Naruto was standing, he noticed that blood was seeping through Sasuke's fingers. Suddenly, Sasuke stopped to catch his breath and slowly removed his hand to reveal the most horrendous wound Naruto ever saw up close. Even though Sasuke's left eye appeared to be unharmed, the area around it was bloody, mutilated, and viciously torn up. The wounds appeared as a wide red circle, with Sasuke's eye in the center. Are you finally ready to come back home Sasuke? It looks like you can barely stand up, let alone fight. I don't want to hurt you any further, but I will if I must. Shouted Naruto, who found it odd that he wasn't out of breath or sore all over. He found it even more odd that Sasuke was acting like he wasn't there, like he was invisible or something. Hey, Sasuke, are you listening to me? Shouted Naruto, hoping his louder tone would break Sasuke out of his trance. But to his dismay, Sasuke said nothing, but started to limp towards Naruto again, like he was determined to close the distance between them. Even though the Achiha was sounding like every step was killing him, he carried on regardless. This only made Naruto's last nerve finally snap. Hey, you fucking bastard. Answer me wh, but what happened next effectively stopped the blonde's rant. Instead of shoving him away or starting the fight again like Naruto had expected him to, Sasuke just walked right through him like he was some sort of illusion. When Naruto tried to turn around, he suddenly collapsed to his hands and knees, feeling completely drained of energy for some unexplained reason. Despite this sudden new development, Naruto willed himself to move his body so that he could see where Sasuke was heading. It was like trying to crawl around with 500 pounds attached to his body, but he nonetheless successfully managed to move his body so that he could see what Sasuke was walking towards. But what met his sight was something that he never wanted, let alone comprehend, to see with his own eyes. There, right in front of him, stood Sasuke staring down his own body, with a gaping, bloody hole right where his heart would be. Already, blood was steadily flowing out of the wound. Sasuke just stared at the corpse that used to be his opponent, as if he couldn't really accept that he had killed Naruto. Suddenly, Sasuke felt blood rush up to his throat and was forced to hack it up. As the blood spattered onto the body's face, Sasuke collapsed to his knees out of fatigue, his face inches away from touching the corpse's face. As he stared at the now lifeless face, his headband slipped off of his head and clattered to the ground, right next to the head. Sasuke's blank stare then twisted into a smirk. Eh, just like I predicted, not a scratch on my headband. Said Sasuke, in an arrogant tone, before he winced and clutched at his left eye. But, I didn't expect you to actually go for a crippling shot, I'll give you that. Ugh, I think you might have blinded me, I may have lost the ability to use the Sharingan in this eye. But, it's thanks to you that I am one step closer to obtaining vengeance on Itachi. 
As Sasuke turned to face beyond the Valley of the End, Naruto saw Sasuke's right eye contort and change until it hardly even looked like a Sharingan. It had a black background and a six-pointed red star on top of it. As he got up on his feet and began to walk towards the border separating Hai no Kuni and Odo no Kuni, going through Naruto again, Sasuke spared one last glance towards Naruto's body. For all it's worth, I really wish that someone else would try to stop me. Said Sasuke quietly, before turning back and continuing on towards Itagakur. Naruto, getting somewhat controlled by his shock, tried once again to follow after the escaping Sasuke, only to trip and fall to the ground once again. Only this time, he heard a familiar rattling sound. Looking down, Naruto was shocked to see that he had a long chain coming from where his heart should be. After giving the chain a few tugs, he saw that the chain was somehow attached to the ground. Wah? What the hell is going on here? Why did Sasuke go through me like that? Why are there two of me? And why am I chained to the ground? I don't understand what's going on. Shouted Naruto, whilst trying to break the chain off of him. All rational thought had escaped him, it was as if he were in some nightmare that he couldn't escape from. Just seeing his own body with a gaping hole in his chest was too much for him to handle. I wouldn't be yanking on that if I were you, kiddo. Said a laid-back voice from behind the blonde. The currently freaked-out blonde immediately stopped pulling on his chain and whipped around behind him to see who had just spoken. What he saw was not something that he would have expected. Standing behind him was a girl that was about three years older than him. She had bright brown eyes with a few freckles on her cheeks and had her sandy blonde hair and two pigtails. For some odd reason, Naruto noticed that a fang-like tooth was sticking out from her left upper lip. She was dressed in a black and hakama, along with a white hakama haimo, tubby socks, and shoes. Another thing he noticed was that there was some sort of badge that was tied around her left upper arm. Currently she was staring directly at where Naruto was. Trust me, kiddo, you do not want to damage that chain you're pulling on. Once it breaks and corrodes well, let's just say there are fates far worse than dying. She added for good measure. The shock of seeing the girl staring at him caused Naruto to stop pulling on his chain and stare back at the strange girl that didn't seem to be freaked out at seeing him chained near a dead body identical to himself. It seemed as if they were like that for hours until the girl decided to break the silence. Boy, stop staring at me like that. It's already obvious that I can see you. Interjected the girl, an agitated look replacing her once calm expression. WH what? Are you serious? Can you really see me? Naruto nearly shouted. You're not pulling my leg. Oh please, what kind of girl do you take me for? I never joke about my job or the dead. She said in a dead serious tone. What? What do you mean I'm dead? How can you see me if I'm dead? Who or what are you, huh? Answer me. Hey, don't take that tone for me, bub. It's not my fault that bastard ran you through with that flashy lightning attack. If you weren't dead, then why is there another you laying on the ground, stained with your blood? She shouted, immediately shutting up the panicked blonde. And, as for how I know all of this, I'm a Shinigami, it's my job. This caused the blonde to tilt his head slightly to the side, like a fox would when it saw something confusing. I'm sorry, but when you say Shinigami do you mean? The girl just rolled her eyes, having heard the unasked question over a thousand times. That's right, I'm what your people call a soul reaper. She answered brusquely, hoping that this soul would stop asking questions. She didn't want to be here longer than what was necessary. She walked brusquely towards the recently deceased, intending on performing as quickly as possible and then going back to her quarters to rest. So she was even more annoyed when the soul suddenly leapt away from her. Even though the soul collapsed in a heap afterwards, huffing like it had just completed five consecutive marathons, that little feat did surprise the soul reaper. Pluses or benign souls were able to move somewhat freely, but they became extremely exhausted if they went through extended periods of strenuous movement. Sure, they could move more easily when their chain of fate was severed, but it would only be a matter of time before they turned into hollows. Hey, what's your problem? I'm trying to help you out here. Shouted the girl as she tried to get closer to the blonde soul, but was once again forced to avoid another strike that she almost didn't see coming. I don't need your help, replied Naruto, in between deep breaths. He was completely exhausted, but he wasn't about to allow himself to submit to the very being that sealed him to his hard life. And what, pray tell, makes you think that? I've already had one of your kind fuck my life up by sealing the Kyubi into me as a baby, and I refuse to be toyed with by you and your kind again. Snarled Naruto, in between deep pants, his eyes showing that he was still willing to fight. The girl just stared at Naruto before she glanced towards her right all the while muttering something. Even though he couldn't make out what she was saying to herself, he could make out something that she referred to as a fucking jabakurai. Boy. Don't act like I'm not even here. Since you obviously know about what's happening to me, then I demand that you tell me what the hell is going on. 
this proved to be the wrong thing to say, as the pigtailed girl was instant in front of him, holding him by the collar of his jacket nearly inches from her face. How dare you take that tone of voice with me? Do you know how easily I can crush you like an insect? Just who the hell do you think you're talking to, Brad? She snarled. A stuck-up rude feral-looking bitch of a Shinigami, that's who. Naruto shot back, despite his close proximity with the Death God. Just then, he heard a loud metallic snap, followed by something similar to someone trying to chew metal. Looking down, Naruto saw that the chain was no longer attached to the ground and that the individual links furthest from his heart had sprouted mouths and were eating and chewing into themselves. Ah. What the hell is going on now? Screeched Naruto as he yanked himself free from the Shinigami's grasp and began to swing the chain around in a futile attempt to whip the chewing links off of it. If anything, it caused the mouthed links to start chewing faster. Hey, you knucklehead. Stop doing that and just calm down. The more you freak out, the faster you speed up the encroachment process. And once the process completes itself, you'll turn into something worse than a monster. Shouted the female reaper after nearly getting whacked in the head by the flailing chain. Immediately, Naruto dropped the chain and raised his arms into the air. The cannibalistic chain link slowed their pace but continued to chew at a much slower pace. Alright, now, let's try this again in a calmer manner. Said the pigtailed girl. I'm sorry to say this, but you really are dead, kid. The fact that you have an encroaching chain of fate attached to your chest proves it. And if you need more proof, then just take a look at your bleeding body behind you. Naruto quickly glanced back at his own corpse before turning his attention back to the female Shinigami. But, I've nearly died plenty of times before, like when that traitor Kabuto tried to make mincemeat out of my heart. How do you know that I've actually died? For all I know, the damned fox is holding out on me just to teach me a lesson. It's because of your chain. It has already been severed, meaning you can't return to your body, not that it would have done you any good. Besides, the wound that you've sustained was too much for even a demon like the Kayubi no Kitsune to heal. Was her reply. Yeah, but wait, what do you know about the Kayubi? At this the girl grimaced. Well, having one of us seal something as powerful and chaotic as the Kayubi no Kitsune into a human infant is something that no one in Sirite isn't known for. Even more so that it was done by a human making contact with a Shinigami. Then, do you know exactly who it was that sealed that damn demon into me, or why I can't feel it like I normally do? Asked Naruto hopefully. The girl just shook her head. Can't say that, kid. But, as for your second question, I would assume that it had something to do with the seal that imprisoned the beast within you. Of course. The 8 trigram seal. Thought Naruto. Memories of when he had first met the fox face to face instantly flooded his mind. It was when Jiraiya had thrown him over a deep gorge in order for him to access his Biju's power more easily. The fox said so himself that if his host died, then he would die, as well. Look, kid, we really don't have time to play 20 questions. I have to get you to Soul Society, now. Said the still mysterious girl. But, you can't. Exclaimed Naruto, desperately. I finally have something worth living for. I still have to become Haokage and fulfill all of the promises that I made. DCH, I personally don't see why you have to put in so much effort in keeping any promise you made to those two-faced ingrates. Muttered the girl with a scowl. Hey, don't call my friends that. Shouted Naruto, indignation rising rapidly. What do you know about my life, anyways? More than you know, Naruto Uzumaki. Replied the girl calmly. Seeing the shocked expression on her charge's face, she elaborated. I did a background check on you while I was looking for your location. And I gotta say, I'm surprised that you actually want to go back to the life you had. If I were in your place, I would have left your village ages ago. Unless, you're some kinda masochist that enjoys having everyone put you down and treat you like dirt. Hey, it wasn't that bad. Sure, most of the people in the village hated me and saw me as the fox demon reincarnated, but there were a few people that acknowledged me. Oh yeah? Name them. Well, there's the old man and my old academy sensei, Hiroki Yamino for starters. Began Naruto. Your old man was the leader of the village, he had an entire village to look after. If he really cared about you, then why didn't he do something more drastic to make sure that you had a better life growing up? The fact that he just gave you your own crappy apartment when you got kicked out of the orphanage just shows how he only does the barest minimum when it comes to you. And, as for me. See Dolphin, he practically treated you with cold indifference like everyone else up until he was nearly killed by his traitorous comrade. Was her rebuttal. Don't you dare say that. That's not true. They cared for me when I was younger, when everyone else treated me like shit. Growled Naruto, causing the encroachment to speed up quickly. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry, I take it back. They did care about you. Said the girl in a placating manner, slowing down the encroachment process once again. Are there any others? Yes, there's Tuichi and A.M. from Ichiraku's ramen bar. They were always nice to me. Okay, that's four people. 
There's Pervy Sage and Gramit Sunade, they were nice to me most of the time. There's the Rookie 9 from my class, as well as Bushy Brow's team. Okay, now hold up for a minute. Interrupted the girl. How can you say that? Because, both you and I know that's not entirely true. Naruto gave her a look before continuing on. Okay, so I didn't really get along with Niji, Tenten, Ino, or that Shino guy, but I'm on reasonable terms with everybody else, especially with my tea. Stop right there. Said the Shinigami abruptly. I've seen several cases of delusion, but yours, kid, is by far the worst I've ever seen. And what's that supposed to mean? Hinata has always been nice and friendly to me. Sure, she always acted weird whenever she was around me, but she never once insulted me. And even though Bushy Brows is a bit hard to understand, he's still a nice guy. Right, so that leaves you with a testosterone drunk jerk who constantly insults and put you down so that he could think that he was the alpha male, a violent food addicted fatso that saw as an annoying pest and lazy know-it-all that always spoke to you as if you were a mindless idiot. Okay, now you're just over-exaggerating things. Shikamaru, Kiba, and Choji may have acted like that on a few occasions, but they always hung out with me during my time in the academy. They were my friends. Really? How many times did they invite you to hang out with them after the academy was let out? Did they ever invite you over to their houses? Did they ever take the time to get to know you personally? Naruto tried to come up with some sort of rebuttal, but nothing came to him. As he thought back to when he was still attending the academy, he reluctantly realized that the girl was right. The only time that they actually hung out was whenever they were in class. After that, they hardly hung out with each other. Whenever he saw them with their parents, they would ignore him, like he wasn't even there. And when they tried to go up to them just to say hello, their parents would always shoot hateful glares at him or tell him to get lost. Well, they still hung out with me. And just because they don't meet up to your standards doesn't mean that they aren't good enough to be anyone else's friends, let alone mine. Argued Naruto. Fine, fine. Who am I to say who your friends should be? Besides, with all things considered, they were way better than your so-called teammates and sensei were. Hey. Don't you start insulting my- Don't finish that sentence. What you had was anything but a team. In fact, if you were to look up a team in the antonym section of a thesaurus, your team would be listed. What the hell are you talking about now? My team was one of the best Kanahagakur had to offer. Exclaimed Naruto. The Shinigami just scoffed in disbelief. TCH, if that was your village's best, then I fear for your village's future. What was that? I let you know the Kakashi sensei is one of the best ninjas around. So? Just because he's a good shinobi doesn't automatically mean that he's a good teacher. Besides, in all of your time with your team, he's done a piss poor job of teaching you. That's not true. He was a great teacher. Said Naruto, defensively. Oh really, name one time that he personally taught or trained you. Well, he taught me the tree walking exercise and team tactics started with Naruto. Yeah, yeah, that's all good and all, but did he ever take any time to personally teach you or even offer you any personal pointers? Or what about the Chunin exams? Did he even try to help you prepare for your match? And when you had important information about Ichiha's opponent during the exam, did he even bother to take you seriously? That question had hit Naruto hard, that particular moment was a bitter pill to swallow. The fact that Kakashi had just traded him off to an instructor that had a grudge against him, with only chakra control exercises to work on, still made him resentful of his instructor. How were chakra control exercises going to help him against Niji Hayuga, who was the top rookie out of his graduating class? Even though it all worked out for him in the end, it still hurt that Kakashi preferred to train Sasuke over him. Add the fact that he never once took him seriously about the whole Gara incident just added salt to the wound. And don't even get me started on that prick, Sasuke. Said to the Shinigami, as if she were reading the ex-Shinobi's mind. What your village and nearly all of the women in your old village saw in him, I'll never know. If you ask me, you should have focused on killing that traitor, instead of trying to drag his ass back to your village. Hey, Sasuke was one of the few people that I could relate to. He was like the brother I never had. This elicited an incredulous laugh from the Reaper. Your brother. Your so-called brother spent most of his time belittling you to fuel his own arrogance. He had the entire village eating out of the palm of his hands, and he never once showed any gratitude towards them. Not to mention that he stabbed the entire village in the back, just so that he could learn a few high-power techniques from a traitor. And, here's the icing on the cake, he attempted to kill you multiple times, until he finally succeeded. Kami, I know a person's first love is special and make someone act stupid, but this is. I am not gay. Interrupted Naruto. Really? So, then how do you explain your first kiss during? That was not intentional. That was an accident and nothing more. Exclaimed Naruto, angrily. I was only staring him down when some bastard knocked me off balance and I fell on him. I would have clobbered that jerk who caused that nightmare to happen if I had the chance. Okay, okay, I didn't mean it like that. 
But if Sasuke isn't your lover, then why are you giving him so much leeway, especially when he was the one that took your life? Especially, since he has never respected you as a comrade since the very first day you started working with your team. Again, Naruto was at a loss for words. Sasuke was never pleasant to be around. No matter how hard he tried and trained, Sasuke always seemed to outdo him. And every time he did, the bloody Achiha seemed to take delight in rubbing it in his face. He always envied how everyone automatically seemed to respect and accept Sasuke and secretly wished that he could just switch lives with him. That was why he tried desperately to improve himself so that he would no longer be in Sasuke's shadow. Yet, whenever he did manage to surpass Sasuke in some area, the Achiha became hell-bent to beat him down again or try to one-up him. And last but not least, there's that shallow, self-centered pinky-haired howler monkey of a bitch. Said the Shinigami. No. Don't you dare say that about Sakura. Why shouldn't I? She never said anything pleasant about you, so why should I say anything nice about her? But more importantly, why did you put up with the abuse for so long? What are you? She never treated me badly. Denied Naruto defensively. Is that so? Then what you're saying is that all of those times that she hit you for being nice to her, criticizing her oh so precious Asuke kun, or for any other reason she found justifiable is a way of expressing her affections to you. Wow. I'm so sorry, I had no idea. Replied the girl, sarcasm practically oozing from her voice. SH shut up. She wasn't like that at all. Shouted Naruto, a waver easily detected in his voice. Oh for the love of what the hell's the matter with you? Why are you so defensive with this girl when she never once gave you the time of day? Snarked the Shinigami, her patience with the blonde nearing its limit. Criminy, just how ignorant are you? What the hell are you talking about? I'm not ignorant. Shouted Naruto. If you thought that you had a chance with that shallow pink-haired flat-chested bitch, then you clearly are ignorant. The fact that you're still crushing on that selfish brat just shows how much you're lost in your own world. No matter how nice you were to her, and no matter how many times you've asked her out, she still preferred to be shot down by that Ichiha traitor. That right there should have been enough proof for you to realize that the girl was a lost cause. You take that back. You don't know Sakura-chan like I do. I know that she hardly ever contributes to the team when you're out on the mission and still criticizes you for every little thing that you do. I know that she always takes Sasuke's side whenever you have an argument with that prick. And I also know that she becomes incredibly desperate whenever something or someone threatens said prick, in which case she does something extremely stupid that would endanger herself and everyone else around her. Why are you so dead set on making this girl like you? Because she went through the same problems that I did when she was still a kid. She didn't have many friends, she was being picked on by bullies, and she always felt lonely. So, I take it you tried to help her out. Naruto had the decency to blush at that comment while simultaneously scratching the back of his head. Well I did sort of get back at those bullies and I tried to talk to her once, but, let me guess, she was already hanging around with that other brainless Achiha loving cow, uh, what's her name? It had something to do with sows or was it pigs? You know. Yeah, that's it. Naruto said nothing, his head seemingly focused on the ground. It was all too true. After she became friends with Ino Yamanaka, Sakura's attitude completely changed. She immediately started acting like all of the other girls in the academy. Since she didn't get a response out of the soul, she interpreted it as an affirmative answer. That only made turn her nose up into the air in disgust. Heh, that just proves that she was never worth all the time you spent pining over her. Will. You. Shut up. You have no right to criticize Sakura-chan like that. She is a lot nicer, since when? Interrupted the Reaper, her tolerance for the whiskered blonde finally giving way to her frustration. Since when has your beloved Sakura-chan ever treated you kindly? She never once gave you a chance to actually date you. She never complimented you whenever you accomplished something she couldn't, she never passed up a chance to either hit or insult you, and she was never nice to you. Hell, she never even thanked you for saving her own life, which she automatically assumed was saved by Sasuke, the ninja that couldn't do jack shit against that bloodthirsty Suna kid. And if that's not enough for you, she then had the gall to beg, with tears flowing from her eyes, for you to bring her Sasuke back. She specifically used you to get her Prince Charming back to her, not giving a shit if you or any of your teammates came back alive. All throughout the Reaper's tongue lashing, Naruto tried frantically to come up with a refute to her argument, anything to stop her from going on. But try as he might, he just couldn't do it. The years of denial and self-delusion were finally catching up to him, overwhelming him with a torrent of emotions he had been holding back. Confusion, despair, hopelessness, frustration, but most of all, anger. Thirteen years of repressed rage began to flow all over his body, like lava flowing from an erupting volcano. And it wasn't the anger he would usually show around in public, but the deep-seated kind that he felt ever since he was a kid. He was angry at the Yandame Haokage for sealing the Kayubi inside of him. 
He hated that he was always targeted because of the Kyubi. He was angry that the villagers, shinobi, and civilians never took time to actually get to know him, instead seeing him as the Kyubi reincarnated. He hated that he had worked his fingers to the bone just to get the things that his peers often took for granted. He hated that his own teammates used him as fodder for their jokes and always looked down at him as the lowest standard. And, most importantly, he was angry with himself for letting his life continue to degrade to such a sad state. The Shinigami, oblivious to the internal strife going on in Naruto's mind, continued on with her tirade. It's time to face facts, Bucko. Your sensei was a two-faced, lazy favorite playing hypocrite. Your brother was a heartless, arrogant, power-hungry traitor. And your so-called crush was a good-for-nothing, materialistic, talentless whore who gave Kinoichi and women everywhere a bad name. Fuck you replied Naruto in a cold, detached voice. Now it was the Shinigami's turn to appear to be lost for words. Sure, she had heard that phrase hundreds of times before, but she never heard it in that way. The way it sounded made her think of someone that was about to kill her. It took her a moment to realize that it was a freaking plus that said that to her. A freaking plus. Already, she felt her resolve not to physically harm the boy in front of her deteriorate at a rapid pace. What did you just say to me? She said in a tone that was promising unimaginable amounts of pain. I said fuck you. Fuck you you fucking Shinigami bitch. Snarled Naruto, his head shooting up to stare the reaper right in the eyes. The very sight of those eyes elicited a gasp from the reaper, as they were not like those she'd ever seen in a plus nor a hollow. The sclera were a deep blood red, while the corneas remained blue. But it was the pupils that started to make her uneasy. Instead of the normal circular pattern that she saw in both pluses and hollows alike, there were feral slits that sent chills down her spine. But that was nothing compared to the sudden flood of Naruto and a violent mixture of black and red, which slowly began to condense and take the form of some large animal. You fucking Shinigami are the reason why my life was so fucked up. Your kind were the ones that sealed the Kaiubi into me, cursing me to a life of being the entire village's scapegoat. Your kind caused me to experience perpetual prejudice and discrimination for something I had no control over. I had to work non-stop to try and salvage the mangled life that I was given, constantly fighting tooth and nail just to be accepted amongst my peers like a normal person. And now, when I've finally made some leeway into improving my life, you criticize the fuck out of it and tell me that I have to leave it behind. Well, fuck you. Fuck the whole lot of you Shinigami bastards. I know that my life was harsh. I know that it should have been better, but it was the only life that I had, damn it. Hollered Naruto, as the condensed on itself even further, until the Shinigami saw that it resembled a large fox, with huge sharp teeth and nine long tails that were thrashing around, as if they had a mind of their own. The sight was so terrifying that the young Shinigami almost didn't notice the soul's chain began to encroach like a school piranhas going on a feeding frenzy on an obese cow. Any second now, the chain would be completely corroded and the boy would turn into a hollow. And judging by the amount of the soul was generating, she really didn't want to fight it when it became a hollow. That, and she would get in a lot of trouble with her superiors for provoking a plus into corrupting itself. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for being so blunt, I've had a really bad day and I wasn't in the mood to go on this mission. I didn't mean to upset you, but I was just trying to help you pass on. She said, desperate to calm the young boy down. Pass on. Pass on. Why the fuck would I want to pass on? I want my old life back. But I can't do that. It's already too late f don't give me that shit. Your kind can seal giant, malevolent demons that can change the world's landscapes into human beings, and you're telling me that you can't do something as simple as extending a human's life. I can't do that. Your chain of fate has already been severed, the soul can't be returned to the body. You have to let me perform on you so you can go to the soul society. Soul society? Is that what you lot call oblivion? Give me one good reason why I should even think about allowing you to take me to that fucking place. At this point, only about a third of the chain remained. Because if you remain here, you will become a hollow, a monster that feeds on the souls of the living. Once that chain is gone, you will be cursed to an existence of despair, pain, and endless hunger. And considering all that you went through when you were alive, I doubt that you would want to suffer for the rest of eternity. Exclaimed the Shinigami. That tidbit of information was enough for Naruto to subdue his rage as he collapsed to the ground, the exhaustion finally catching up to him. The overbearing started receding until there was nothing left, leaving the plus hunched over on his hands and knees, his face looking at the ground beneath him, and the chain of fate slowly encroaching towards the center of the boy's chest. Seeing that she had little time to accomplish her mission, the Shinigami approached the deceased youth once she determined that he would not attack her. But when she got the boy, she noticed his body was trembling, and there were small damp spots on the ground right underneath where his eyes would be. Then she heard the barely contained sobs. Well, what are you waiting for? Just hurry up and get it over with. 
If I'm going to be sent to this old society, purgatory, or hell, just do it and spare me the suspense. Choke Naruto. Feeling a new wave of pity for the young deceased, the Reaper gently cupped Naruto's chin, her hand, and slowly brought his face, which had tears dripping down his cheeks, up to hers. It was then, Naruto saw the female Shinigami's face. It wasn't emotionless or vindictive like he read in the old history books, it was gentle and sympathetic, which made it even more confusing considering how the girl had acted earlier on. I never said that you were going to hell. She said, softly. The Soul Society isn't as bad as you think it is. It's actually very similar to your village. You'll be able to live in peace, with no one judging you for something that you didn't do. It'll be like getting a second chance to live a good life. But, I'm scared, said Naruto in barely a whisper. I'm scared to see what's on the other side. I'm scared that things will be just the same as when I was alive. The Shinigami gave a gentle smile. It's alright to be afraid. Everyone's afraid when it's their time to go. I know that it's hard to let go, but you'll only be hurting yourself and everyone else if you stay here. Naruto became silent once again, this time remembering all of the people that he did care about and who truly cared about him as well. He didn't want to leave them all behind, but he didn't want to stay and potentially hurt them. But there was still one nagging thought that kept on bothering him. Will it hurt at all? Asked Naruto, quietly. This got a small chuckle from her. Not at all. It's completely painless, so long as you haven't committed any crimes or sins against nature. And before you ask, that excludes you from keeping the Kyubi at bay. With that, she withdrew her katana from the scabbard, causing the blonde boy to flinch. Don't worry, I'm not going to hurt you. She said reassuringly, before she switched her blade into a reverse grip. Wait. Before you send me away, can you at least tell me your name? Asked Naruto. The Reaper was momentarily surprised by the question, very few souls asked for her name. Perhaps, this particular soul wasn't completely annoying. She quickly regained her composure and allowed a smirk to form on her face. Hiyori. My name is Hiyori Surigaki, Lieutenant of the 12th Division. She said in a calm tone. You know, it's customary for a guy to give a girl his name once she gives you hers. Naruto just had to smile. It's Naruto Uzumaki, monkey brat. He said, with a smirk of his own. It appeared that his old personality began to resurface. You're so lucky that I need to get you to the Soul Society. She said, a tick visible on her forehead. She then gently jabbed Naruto in the forehead with the pommel of her sword, leaving behind an approved kanji. Immediately, Naruto felt an overwhelming calming sensation wash over him as his entire body began to glow with bright blue-white light. Subsequently, Naruto slowly began to sink into the ground, leaving behind a black butterfly that fluttered off to the sky. Seeing that her task was gone, Hiyori withdrew a cell phone from her pocket and hit a button in order to contact her superiors. Yo, it's Siragaki. Yeah, the plus has been taken care of. She said. No, I had gotten to him before any hollows could get to him. And it was a good thing too, this particular one was able to be used without even knowing it. Hell, it was even able to take a visible form. What did it look like? I don't know, it kinda looked like some kind of wolf with multiple tails. No, wait, it was a fox. Yeah, yeah, it was a fox. But it had nine tails instead of one. Look, can you just open the gate so I can get home? If you're so interested in this plus, you can read my report. Mere moments after she cut the connection, a large sliding door materialized out of thin air. The door then opened, revealing a blinding white light, yet this did not impede Hiyori from entering through it before it finally phased out of existence. All that was left was the bleeding body of what used to be one Naruto Uzumaki. Suddenly, it started to rain with increasing intensity, as if Mother Nature was crying for the two young shinobi that had lost their innocence. The scene remained as so for nearly five minutes before Kakashi and his packin arrived. Kakashi just stood there, shocked stiff at what he was seeing. He tried to convince himself that the rain was making him see things, but knew that was just wishful thinking on his part. As he slowly approached the body, Packin trotted over to the headband that was laying on the ground. It's Asuke's. The dog said after giving it a few sniffs. His scent is being washed away by the rain. I can't track him anymore. Bakashi remained silent the entire time, just staring at what used to be his hyperactive student, the dead last of the academy, the legacy of the Yandame Haokage. The very sight of Naruto made Kakashi think back to when he first began as the sensei for Team 7. Before he passed the team, he had told his students that he believed that those who broke the rules were trash, but those who abandoned their comrades were lower than trash. But upon retrospect, he realized that he didn't really follow his own teachings. He was lazy when it came to training his students, thinking that he was actually giving them their own space to hone their own skills. And whenever he did take an interest in training with them, he only taught his students teamwork exercises, but never really bothered to stop them whenever they fell apart. 
To make matters worse, he would constantly spend extra time helping Sasuke after their usual team meetings, but didn't extend the same courtesy to Naruto or Sakura. Heck, he even opted to train Sasuke for the exams over Naruto and just passed him off to another so that he wouldn't have to worry about it. It spoke volumes as to how he had failed as an instructor and Naruto paid the ultimate price for his lack of actions. Bakashi, what are you going to do? Asked Pakin as he watched his summoner carefully pick up the body of Naruto into his arms before he went to retrieve the discarded headband. Let's head back home, Pakin, and report this to the Hokage. He replied solemnly. But, what about Sasuke? Are you sure th? I'm sure, Pakin. Interrupted Kakashi, a bit more sternly than he intended. Sasuke's already crossed the border and the rain is washing away his scent. It'll make tracking and finding him nearly impossible. Right. Was all that the small had to say before he and Kakashi leapt off towards Konoha. He knew what was going through Kakashi's mind but decided to just follow his master back home. Not a minute later, something slowly emerged from the ground. At first glance it looked like a plant that was similar to a Venus flytrap. Except, the plant was wearing a black cloak with red clouds, had a head with green hair, as well as arms and legs. But the most noticeable feature of the humanoid plant man was the face. Its head was of two colors meeting at the center of the face, the right side was a dark black, while the left side was white. The odd thing was that only the white side seemed human-like, as half of the mouth and the bright yellow eye was visible. The black side, on the other hand, looked as if it were devoid of any human characteristics, with the exception of a beady yellow eye that showed no cornea or sclera. That fucking prick. Looks like you can always trust the runt of the Achiha clan to screw things up. Said a voice that seemed to have originated from the black half. Indeed. Said a different, more calmer, softer voice that seemed to have come from the left side. The leader will want to hear of this immediately. The medical staff was all abuzz when the members of the Achiha retrieval team were brought back. Whilst Shikamaru and Kiba's injuries weren't serious, Niji and Choji needed immediate attention. The Akimichi heir's body was dangerously atrophied and was suffering the side effects of using his clan's special brand of soldier rations pellets, the three colored pills. Niji, on the other hand, had multiple stab wounds, as well as two gaping holes that were caused by his opponent's high-powered arrows. Even though the hospital had Tsunade and Shizun medical expertise to help them, the severity of the wound still kept them busy. Kiba and his partner, Akimaru, weren't in life-threatening danger, but they were going to be out of commission for a while. Surprisingly, Shikamaru had only a few scraps and bruises, a broken finger, and mild chakra exhaustion to show for his part in the mission, and was thus treated fairly quickly. Rock Lee, a newly healed ninja that had volunteered his services to the team, was just suffering from some pulled muscles and exhaustion. Currently, the young Nara was sitting in the corridor that branched off to the two operating rooms that Niji and Choji were currently occupying. Across from him was Tamari, one of the three shinobi from Sunagakur that answered the Hokage's request for backup. It was thanks to her team that Kiba, Lee, and himself managed to make it back without receiving any more grievous injuries. But, that wasn't what troubled Shikamaru. From the moment he reached the hospital, his mind had been replaying everything that went wrong on the mission. He had known that it was going to be troublesome, but he had never expected this much trouble. The ninja that had escorted Sasuke to Itagakur were something else, almost like something out of a horror movie. Every time one of his comrades stayed to fight Odonin so that the team could continue their pursuit, he couldn't stop himself from thinking that he had sent one of his friends to their death. After Choji and Niji had stayed behind and they had managed to successfully get Sasuke away from his escort team, he briefly thought they had a sliver of a chance at succeeding. But it all went downhill when Kiba and Akimaru got caught in the explosion from the explosive note that they had planted to cover their escape. They weren't hurt by the explosion, but the shock wave had thrown them and the lipstick wearing Odonin over the ravine. Subsequently, another Odonin came out of nowhere and had reacquired Sasuke before running back towards the borderline. Realizing that Naruto's abilities were more adept for combat, he acted as a diversion so that Naruto could continue on. The battle from then on was by no means a walk in the park for him. The Kanoichi was just as fierce and bloodthirsty as were all the rest of the Odonin that he had encountered. Yet whereas her teammate specialized in brute strength and heavy hitting, she relied on strategy as well as a trio of blind ogre-like monsters to fight. The fight had forced him to use every trick that he knew, but it still wasn't enough to fully incapacitate her. But when it looked as if he was going to die, that troublesome fan-wielding Kanoichi came out of nowhere and literally blew the enemy away with ease. It wasn't that he was ungrateful for Tamari's help, but her fashion of dealing with her opponent strongly reminded her of his mother. Hey, pineapple head, stop brooding over what happened out on the field. And apparently, she had the same mind-reading powers as well. What was that? Asked Shikamaru. I said, stop wasting time brooding over what happened during the mission. Tamari repeated. From what I heard, you and your friends were way over your heads. 
Right from the very start. Agreed Shikamaru. I knew all along that we were going against ninjas that were on a whole different level than all of us. And yet, I still sent my comrades, guys that I knew, as a little kid, to fight enemies that I knew they had no chance of defeating. They were living people, each with their own personalities, hopes and dreams, and I treated them like pawns in a shogi game. Well, that's one way of putting it. But, like it or not, that's what leaders sometimes have to do. Caring about the welfare of your team is fine and all, but there are some cases where the completion of the mission takes priority over everything else. Said to Mari, as she crossed her legs. Chikamaru just stood up with a HMPH and started to make his way out of the waiting room, confusing to Mari. Hey, what do you think you're doing? Going to resign as a shinobi. There's no way I can deal with all of the stress and responsibilities of this rank. Hell, I didn't even want to be in the first place. And given how badly this mission went, I doubt that I'll be able to remain for much longer. It's just too troublesome to deal with. Said Shikamaru as he began to walk off. The Mari responded in kind with an unladylike snort. Never took you for such a crybaby. Sure, I knew that you were a quitter, but I thought that you would at least be man enough to weather it out for a while before you decide that you're not ready for the responsibilities. She said, hoping to get the young Nara to make a comeback or for his personality to revert back to when he was fighting against her during the exams. Well, I guess I'm not the person that you thought I was. Sorry to disappoint you, but that's life, it's full of disappointments. Retorted Shikamaru, not raising Tasuna Kanoichi's barb, his tone sounding defeated. The Greenhorn continued on his way towards the Shinobi Registry building. He was just passing by a hallway intersection when he saw his father leaning against the wall that was perpendicular to the path that he was taking. Are you just gonna let a girl talk down to you like that? He drawled, his eyes still closed. I guess you're not really a man after all. That made Shikamaru stop in his tracks. He didn't expect his father to be there, nor did he expect him to be listening in on his chat with Tamari. It's too troublesome to deal with right now. And besides, I'm still a kid, so I don't really have to worry about acting unmanly. Yes, you can't really call yourself a man, not with your current attitude. Do you think that just because your first mission failed, that gives you the right to just walk away from everything? Your comrades trusted you to lead them to the best of your abilities. They already knew of the dangers they were going to encounter when they left the village gates. They were aware of the risks that they would likely encounter in the mission, yet they still followed you. And here you are, griping about how everything went wrong, as if you get the right to say that they fought a battle that wasn't important. Did you even stop to think what your comrades' reaction would be if they found out that you want to quit after one failed mission? Are you going to let all of their hard work and sacrifices be for nothing? Well. Shikamaru just stood there, silent and unresponsive. His normally laid-back father's words had struck a chord within him, making him actually reconsider his decision. If Kiba and Naruto were to catch wind of his decision to withdraw from active service, they would have never let him hear the end of it. But at the same time, he couldn't in good conscience continue on, as Shinobi knowing that he was responsible for Niji and Choji critical injuries. If they were crippled for the rest of their lives, or even worse died from their wounds, how could he possibly lead anyone else? Just then, the door to Choji's operation room opened. Shikamaru whirled around to see Tsunade walking out. As if she could sense what was going on in the young Nara's mind, she sent him a comforting smile. There's nothing to worry about anymore. Choji Akimichi is going to be alright. She said reassuringly, as she took a seat on the bench. He was in critical condition, but we were able to stop the side effects of the Akimichi's three colored pills, thanks to the deer antlers that your clan provided, Shikaku. Heh, it's always a pleasure to help the village, whether it's out in the field or in the hospital, Lady Haokage. Replied Shikaku coolly. He then took a quick glance towards his son, whom he could see was in what was akin to shock that his best friend was really going to be alright. Judging from his earlier behavior, Shikaku could tell that Shikamaru was expecting the worst possible outcome. Suddenly, the door to the operating room where Niji was held opened, and out walked Shizun. She was panting slightly, and the light showed that she had sweat collecting on her brow, but she looked triumphant nonetheless. Niji Hayuga's operation is a success. The fatal injuries have been treated, and he is no longer in critical condition. But, he'll need to be out of active duty in order to properly heal. Shikamaru just stood there, silently taking in all of the status reports of the heavily injured members of his squad. From what he had seen when he got back to the hospital, Choji and Niji's injuries were fatal, and that their deaths were imminent. Yet, by some miracle, they managed to survive. Shikamaru tried to remain optimistic that everything was going to turn out alright, yet there was still one lingering dreadful outcome that constantly pestered him to no end. Is there any word of Naruto? Asked Tsunade, masking her worry with the calm facade that she used in public. Shizun was about to answer her mentor when one of the medic nins that were sent to retrieve Fullen Shinobi approached the group. Lady Haokage, he said, immediately gaining the attention of everybody present. 
Jonin Kakashi Haddock has just returned. He brought back the body of Jen and Naruto Uzumaki. He continued solemnly. The room became swiftly silent as everyone tried to comprehend what had been ceremoniously dropped on their laps. His body? Started Tamari. Or are you saying that Naruto Uzumaki is dead? Continued the medic. From what I gathered, the fatal wounds on Uzumaki are consistent with those that the Chidori are known to make. Haddock has confirmed this theory and has also stated that it was Sasuke Uchiha who performed the. No one dared to utter a single word. It was just too absurd to accept what they had just heard. It was like they had just heard that the entire world was going to blow up in the next 24 hours. Despite her shock, Shizun turned to see what her mentor's own reaction would be, knowing that the older woman had started to see the younger blonde as a surrogate son. As she gazed upon the Hokage, even though it seemed as Tsunade was calm and serious, the young medic nin could tell that the news was tearing her up inside. She didn't know what to do or what to say next. Lady Tsu, Shizun said to the Hokage, suddenly cutting off her apprentice, I want you to stay here and supervise the medical teams in charge of the two genin's treatment. Alert me if there are any signs of trouble. We already lost one shinobi from this damn mission, I will not lose any more of our soldiers. And before Shizun could say anything, Tsunade left accompanied by the medic nin to see Kakashi for his report and to examine Naruto's body, as proper protocol stated for any leaf shinobi that died on a mission. With the Haokage gone, the room was filled with a tense silence, with no one daring to utter a word. The quiet atmosphere, however, was abruptly interrupted when Shikamaru fell to his knees before leaning forwards and landing on his hands. His body trembled as he held back the sobs that were trying to come out. He knew that it was unmanly to be seen crying in front of everyone and that a shinobi should have better control over his emotions, yet he was unable to stop the tears that started to leak from his clenched eyes. The cold hard fact the once hyperactive loud blonde was now no longer alive. That his old classmate, his fellow member of the four losers, his comrade, was dead. This is all my fault. He said in a strained voice. I've barely been for a whole month and I've already gotten one of my teammates killed and on my first mission as leader too. Said Shikamaru, his emotions in upheaval, despite his clipped tone. Damari, in a rare instance of benevolence, dropped down next to the distraught Nara and embraced him in a gentle hug. It's not your fault. She said, her voice low enough so only he could hear it. You and your friends were up against shinobi that could easily take down two veterans without sustaining injuries. Newly promoted are never expected to be ready for those sorts of missions, you did the best you could. Yeah, but my best wasn't good enough to make sure everyone survived. As leader, it was my duty to see that my teammates made it out alive, regardless of the mission. Yet, I can't even do that right. If only I tried harder, if only I hadn't separated the team, then maybe we could have had Shikamaru struggling to finish his line of thought, all the while trying to restrict the amount of tears that were already trailing down his cheeks. Tamari said nothing as she tightened her arms around him. Despite her normal harsh and abrasive attitude that she sported whenever she was out in the field, she herself knew that there was nothing more saddening than losing a comrade that you had known throughout your childhood and decided not to taunt him for his lapse in composure. Especially since said comrade was the one kid that had single-handedly defeated her youngest brother and helped him change for the better. Chikaku said nothing as he watched the interaction between his son and Suna Kinoichi from afar. Whilst he didn't show it, he too felt remorse for what his son was going through. He knew that Shikamaru would have had to deal with one of his comrades dying sometime during his time as a shinobi, but he had hoped that it wouldn't have been so soon, preferably when he had a few years of experience under his belt. As for Naruto's death, well, he didn't know what to think. Even though he didn't actively despise the boy for what he contained, he did try to keep his son's interaction with him as minimal as he could in order to protect him from the civilians and other shinobi. He could tell that things were starting to look up for them as he watched how the blonde was slowly gaining trust amongst the populace. But, as the Jonin commander for his village, he realized that Naruto's death would be seen as a sign of vulnerability, with their only son gone. Their enemies might even see it as the right chance to strike and further weaken their village. Shizun, on the other hand, just made her way to Choji's room, a lone tear sliding down her cheek. She couldn't stand being in the waiting room, so she decided to do what her master instructed her to do, hoping that it would distract her from the fate of the boy she had started to see as a little brother. With Naruto, unknown location, the very first thing that Naruto noticed once he had regained his bearings was that he was staring up at a bleary gray sky. The second thing was that he lay flat on his back on the hard, unforgiving surface of the earth and ground. As he slowly sat up, he saw that he was lying in the middle of the street in some city that he was unfamiliar with. The designs of the buildings were familiar to some of the buildings that he had seen around Kanoha, only they seemed a bit more worn down than the ones he was used to. Some of them looked as if they were about to be demolished, if the broken windows and weathered walls were anything to go by. 
Looking around himself, Naruto saw a few shops set up on both sides of the street, selling products ranging from food and clothes to jewelry and other trinkets that Naruto never truly cared about. A few people walked past him, going past him in both directions, some were dressed in normal clothes, while others were wearing what looked to be rags. It wasn't until a passerby's shoulder nudged into him that Naruto realized his surroundings weren't the only things that had changed since he had been whisked away from the land of the living. On was his ruined and battered orange jumpsuit, and in its place was an ordinary white kimono, with his shuriken and kunai holster still strapped to his right thigh. And instead of his normal blue shinobi sandals, he saw that he had on a pair of Zori sandals, complete with a pair of white tabi socks. Okay, this is just weird. Thought Naruto, as he moved around to get a better feel for the strange clothes he was now wearing. I'm pretty sure that monkey brat didn't mention automatically getting new clothes when you get into Soul Society. And I had expected Soul Society to be a bit nicer than this. Everything looks so run down here, almost like the land of waves when Gato was still in control. Looking around, he saw that there were hardly any people up and about, it was as if he was stuck in a ghost town. Figuring that had nothing to lose, Naruto went up to the merchant that was managing a jewelry stand close to where he was standing, thinking that the man would have some idea where he was. As he got closer, he saw that the man in question had a drastically receding hairline and a large gut. Excuse me sir. He started. Hi, I'm a bit lost, and I was this off, Cretan. Interrupted the man. I don't associate myself with new arrivals like you. Naruto was momentarily stunned at the outright rudeness of the man. He didn't even know the guy, yet he was being treated as if he had egged his house. I'm sorry, is there something wrong? The blonde asked. Yeah, there is something wrong. The man sneered. You're holding up business just by standing there. I'm trying to make a profit so that I don't have to move out of my apartment and I'm not going to be able to sell my wares if some penniless new arrival like you keeps looking around. Now unless you're going to buy something, the I suggest that you get the fuck out of here. But, I just need directions. Said Naruto. All I want to know is, hey, street rat. Get out of the way. Shouted a new voice from behind him. Turning around, he saw a gaudy looking woman that was wearing a heavy amount of makeup and had wrinkles around her eyes. She was wearing a faded and wrinkled gown and a dirty feather boa. Behind her were two other women that were dressed in a similar fashion, yet seemed a few years older than the woman in front of them. Are you deaf, you stupid fool? Get out of our way. Honestly, high-class socialites such as ourselves should not have to deal with low-brow trash such as you. She said in a haughty tone before she whipped open a fan and began to fan herself, her followers copying her a second later. What did you just say to me, you ugly hag? Snarled Naruto, his patience already dangerously close to breaking. All he wanted was some damn directions. He had only just arrived at this old society or whatever this place was called, and yet he was already beginning to feel like he was still in Konoha. How dare you speak to us in such a manner? The lead woman shrieked. You have no right to even be seen by us, let alone talk to us. Now get out of here before I call the authorities to do away with you. She said smugly. Naruto was sorely tempted to open a can of Wupass on the pompous woman before him, just the way she spoke to him made him want to hurt her. Badly. Yet, his conscience kept nagging him that doing so would just cause more problems for him in the long run. Not to mention that he was completely new to this area, and there was the off chance that the woman before him, no matter how unpleasant, actually had the power to order the authoritative figures to arrest him. So, with great reluctance, Naruto just merely walked away from the merchant and a trio of unattractive ladies, having to use every ounce of self-restraint not to attack them when he saw the smug looks they were sending him. Yes, that's right. Go back to whatever dump you crawled out of. She said, her voice full of arrogance and self-importance. I'll remember this, you old, wrinkly bitch. Thought Naruto darkly. Already feeling distrustful towards the people's souls whatever they were, the blonde decided that he would be better off wandering aimlessly down the street, trying to find out where exactly he was by himself. He did not die just to be placed in an afterlife similar to the life he previously had. Some time later, okay, so maybe going off on my own without asking anyone where I am wasn't my brightest idea. Thought Naruto, as he looked around the now seemingly abandoned area. He had been wandering for some time and was still oblivious as to where he was. He had reckoned that along the way, he would have found something or someone that could tell him where exactly he was. But, as luck would have it for the blonde, he came up with Zilch. And the people that he did ask for help were either too busy to notice him or were only willing to give him information that didn't really explain anything to him. So far, he had learned that he was in Rukongai, more specifically District Number 64, the North Alley of Wandering Spirits. Well isn't that ironic? I'm blindly meandering about in a district that's named after Wandering Spirits. And where the hell is Rukongai? I thought that I was supposed to be sent to Soul Society, not the district for lost spirits. 
man, I've been dead for barely a day, and I've already been royally screwed over. I should have known better than to trust that Shinigami bitch, monkey brat. I should have just kicked her and T Naruto's inner rage was cut short when he saw something that he had seen several times before in his life, and had even experienced it a couple of times himself. There in front of him was a girl that was about the same age as he was. She had strawberry blonde hair that came down to her neck. But what really got Naruto's attention was the dirty and torn clothing she was wearing. To make matters worse, it looked as if she was in serious pain, judging on how she was swaying from side to side as she moved at a snail's pace and clutching at her stomach as if it were taking every ounce of her strength to just walk. What was the final straw for Naruto was when he saw her finally collapse to the ground, yet none of the people passing by didn't even stop to see if she was alright. They just continued on their way, as if what had happened was commonplace. Without wasting a beat, Naruto rushed over to the girl laying on the ground, already fearing the worst. All thoughts of finding out where he was were put on hold, as he concentrated on examining the girl for any severe injuries. After a brief search turned up nothing, Naruto carefully turned her over so that he could see the girl's face. But, as he finally got a look at her visage, he was met with a pair of pale, sky-blue eyes staring back at him with almost no life to them. The dirt smudges that adorned her face hinted that she had lived in a severely impoverished state for a while. Hey. Hey, kid. Are you alright? Come on, speak to me. Asked Naruto, as he gently nudged the girl, hoping that she could somehow respond to him. He had felt something akin to a pulse from her earlier, but he was still afraid that the girl's condition could worsen. Thankfully, it looked like the mysterious girl was still alive, as her eyes locked onto his. Her lips made many skewl movements, as if she were trying to tell him something, but Naruto couldn't hear anything. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. What did you say? He said, while placing his ear closer to her mouth, in hopes that he could hear whatever she was saying and get some sort of clue as to what was ailing her. Ung Rai so hungry she rasped in a pitiful tone. Just hearing those words made Naruto feel as if someone had grabbed onto his heart with their bare hands and crushed it. Having experienced a horrible sensation on multiple occasions whilst he was alive, Naruto knew all too well how much pain the girl was in. But that thought alone just brought up more questions. Did souls really need to eat? Were there animals that could be hunted for food? Could he even taste food? And was there any place that served ramen? No, no, no. Stay focused, damn it. You have an emergency here. Naruto mentally berated himself. Quickly regaining his senses, Naruto quickly glanced about to get a better grasp of his surroundings. He noticed that up ahead of him to his left was a large section thriving with several trees and shrubbery which he assumed was a park of some sort. Gingerly picking the girl up, Naruto quickly made his way towards the area, looking for a safe and secluded spot. Seeing an old tree that was in the corner of the shrub fence that boxed in the entire park, Naruto carefully placed the girl down and propped her against the tree. He then crouched down so that he was at eye level with her. Alright, I have gone away for a while. He said calmly. What? But, why? The girl asked, frantically, please, D. I didn't say that I was leaving for good. He said, placating. I'm just going out to get some food and medical supplies, alright. So I need you to stay here and wait until I come back, okay? Can you do that for me? The girl just looked up at him desperately, her eyes slowly glistening, as if she were seeing him for the last time. It made him think that she had experienced something like this before. Look, I promise you that I won't leave you behind. I give you my word that I will come back for you. If there's one thing about me that's always absolute is that I never go back on my word. He said looking her in the eye with a serious expression. He had to hold back the flinch as he remembered how he had ended up in this place. His words had the desired result though, as the girl no longer looked as if she were about to cry. Yet, he could still see some doubt in her eyes. She stared intently at him for what seemed like ages until she raised her right fist with her pinky finger extended. Pinky promise? She asked. Naruto just smiled as he hooked his own pinky finger with hers. Pinky promise. He answered, confidently. Now I really have to go before all of the good stuff is gone. But I'll be back, I promise. He said before he dashed out back onto the main street. As he ran he couldn't help but wonder why he had brought up his old. The very fact that he had failed to uphold his own way of the ninja made him feel ashamed of himself, especially since he had used it to calm the poor girl down. To him, it was as if he had lied to her, which made him feel even worse. How could he have made such a promise to a girl he had just met when he couldn't even fulfill the important promises he made to his teammate? Hell, what right do I have to keep it at all, since I failed Sakura-chan? He thought, grimly, before schooling his face with a serious expression. But I don't have time to mope and feel sorry for myself. I made a promise to someone that truly needs my help. I can't afford to let her down. She's been without food for far too long, I have too at that point, Naruto felt like kicking himself for not thinking things through. 
In his rush to help the girl, he had forgotten that he lacked one important necessity. Money, the very thing that makes the world turn round, as some had put it. Naruto couldn't believe how he had forgotten something so crucial. How was he even going to get anything without any money? He knew for a fact that he didn't have a single cent on him when he passed on to Rukongai. And he was definitely sure that the mysterious girl didn't have any on her either, otherwise she wouldn't have been in her current condition. Just as Naruto was about to start mentally beating himself up for not thinking things through yet again, he suddenly realized that he was already in one of the open market sections that mainly sold food, clothes, medicine, and other necessities. Reckoning that he just didn't pay attention to where he was going, he stared longingly at the products that were so close and yet so far from him. Judging by the appearances of the vendors, the former shinobi surmised that they wouldn't be too keen towards charitable donations for children in need. But seeing as he was pressed for time and had no way of paying for what he needed, Naruto had to accept that his only other option was to steal whatever he needed. He knew that he was capable of pulling it off, but it was all a matter of timing, having the right tools available, and being able to have an effective distraction. His training had prepared him for dealing with a situation like this, and he was lucky that he still had his shuriken kunai holster with him. Now, all he needed was someone to use as a distraction and possibly to pin the blame on. Naruto darted into a nearby alley and began to look for a possible stool pigeon for him to use. Despite the fact that there were a lot more people up and about than he last recalled, he saw no one that really stood out and could draw the attention away from him properly. That is, until he saw a disturbance approaching the stands that he was targeting. His eyes widened once he had gotten a decent glance at what exactly was causing the ruckus. Oh, this is just perfect. He thought gleefully as he got a devious look on his face. Back at the park, the girl waited patiently by the tree that the blonde boy had placed her by. She had nothing to do except sit under the tree and try to keep her mind off of her growling and gurgling stomach. She didn't know how she had gotten in her current predicament or for that matter, why that strange whiskered boy was helping her. Sure, she was grateful that someone was willing to help her when everyone else just turned their nose up and passed by, but she was suspicious as to why he would even bother helping her. Naturally, all of her time living on her own had made her suspicious of others, so she couldn't understand why he wanted to help her. But what really confused her was how she ended up nearly starving to death, she had never been that bad off before. At least, that's what she thought. Frankly, she couldn't figure out how exactly she got like this. She knew that she lived on her own and that she was looking for a place to sleep. The last thing that she remembered before passing out was bumping into some man dressed in white before she felt something collide against the back of her head. When she regained consciousness, she was lying on the ground with no clue as to where she was going and feeling exhausted. And thus, she began to wander around District 64, hoping that she would come across something that would help regain her memories. But all that she had accomplished was nearly dying of starvation and yet coming closer to finding out what happened. Hey, I'm back. Sorry to keep you waiting. Recognizing the voice from that mysterious boy, the girl was brought out of her musings to see a sight that she couldn't believe. The boy had returned, heavily laden with loaves of bread, fruits, sandwich meats, sliced cheese, vegetables, bottles of water, bandages, healing ointments, two blankets, and other necessities. She was rendered speechless, trying to comprehend how he had managed to steal so much without getting caught. Naruto, on the other hand, took her silence as a negative reaction. Is this not enough? Because, if you want more, I can always, what? No, 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 no. That's alright. This is more than enough. The girl said, before Naruto went off again. I'm just surprised that you've brought back so much, that's all. How did you manage to sneak away with all of this anyway? Naruto's eyes darted to the right as he recalled how he had pulled the hit off. Back at the open market, let go of me. Let go of me this instant, you filthy pigs. Screeched the gaudy looking from before as she and her two friends were being hauled off by the three Shinigami that were assigned to patrol the district that day. Do you have any idea of who we are? Yeah, we do. You and friends are the main suspects for the robberies that occurred at two major stands. Replied the patrolling Shinigami testily. Us? Thieves. That's absolutely absurd. We would never do something so dastardly, it is completely beneath us. She shouted. Oh, really? Then would you mind explaining to me what you all were doing at the scene of the crime? Or for that matter, why we found stolen merchandise from the stands in question, as well as the weapons that was used in the robberies on all three of you, hmm? said the Shinigami, as he held up two plastic evidence bags containing a roll of bandages and two of the several four-pointed stars that were found at the scene of the crime. The woman's eyes widened at seeing the objects. BB but, that's impossible. Those aren't mine. I've never seen, never seen them in my entire life. Ha. Huh. If I had a yen for every time I've heard that excuse, my division wouldn't be tasked with guarding the north alley of wandering spirits. Now, come on. 
we've got to sell back at the station with you and your friend's names on it. He said, as he and his partners dragged the three suspects back to the detainment center, the women all the while struggling and ranting about how they were framed or how they didn't deserve to be treated like commoners. At the park, let's just say that I had some help from a few people that I met earlier. Said Naruto lamely, as he placed all of the food he had gotten on a blanket that he had placed on the ground. Well go ahead, dig in. You look like you haven't eaten in a year. The girl didn't need to be told twice, as she all but dived into the massive food that Naruto had brought back. She quickly grabbed an apple and took a large bite out of it, practically trembling in delight at finally having something edible to eat. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. You've truly saved my life. She said euphorically, as she then grabbed a pear and began to take alternating bites from the fruits. It wasn't long until they were reduced to cores before she went to grab two more apples to eat. Naruto just sat there and watched the girl go to town on the fruits, vegetables, and an entire baguette that was in front of her. He was happy to have helped her, but just seeing her eat so ravenously made him feel sorry for her. This girl he thought sadly, she really has been without food for a while. But what is she doing out here all alone? Shouldn't her parents be taking care of her? A sudden growling sound from his stomach brought a small blush to his face. Apparently the hit had taken a lot more out of him than he had thought. He just hoped that she didn't take any notice. The girl, however, did take notice, as she was just about to devour another apple, when she heard a familiar gurgling sound that didn't come from her own stomach for once. Realizing just where the sound came from, she offered the apple that she was about to eat to the only person that ever bothered to help her. Uh, no thanks. I'll be alright. Besides, you need this more than I do. I can go for a while without eating. Said Naruto sheepishly. He didn't want to actually take any of the food that he had gotten for her and hoped that she would just take his word for it. The girl didn't buy into his act as she thrust the apple closer to him, giving him a dead serious look. Oh, alright. If you insist. Said Naruto as he accepted the offered fruit from the girl. Her expression brightened after that. It wouldn't be right if you just sat there and watched me eat after everything that you've gone through to get all of this. Besides, I know how painful it is to go without food, so I wouldn't want you to go through the same experience. So help yourself, it's your food too. She said sweetly, a small smile adorning her face. Naruto couldn't help smiling, as well. As he took a bite out of the apple, he had to agree with Tuchi and AM, people were more pleasant with a full stomach. Oh, by the way, I don't think we've introduced ourselves. He said in between bites. The name's Naruto Uzumaki, what's yours? The girl swallowed the piece of bread that she was currently chewing. I'm Ranjiku Matsumoto. It's nice to meet you, Naruto-kun. She answered with that same cute smile. You're a really nice person, but I don't think that I've ever seen you around here before. Why is that, Naruto-kun? Nordo's demeanor darkened at Ranjiku's question. Well, to tell you the truth, the reason that you've just met me is because I've just recently died, Ranjiku-chan. He said, sadly. Oh. I'm so sorry, I didn't know. I didn't mean to bring it up. Said Ranjiku, immediately regretting asking her question. No, it's okay, Ranjiku-chan. You didn't know about it. Even though I've only been dead for a short while, I'm beginning to adjust. Replied Naruto, soothingly. I just wish that the damn Shinigami didn't lie to me. Lie to you? Why would a Shinigami lie to you? Thanks for watching my video, leave a like if you enjoyed my video, and also do consider subscribing to my channel for more awesome content. See you next time, till then sayonara.